the idea behind continuous delivery is that you deploy really small chunks of code, right? I, you did a feature, 50 lines of code. How wrong can it go? And if it goes wrong, you will fix it easily because it's a very small thing that you deployed, right? You're deploying multiple times a day. And by deploying multiple times a day, that means that your delivery is much faster, right? You're not thinking any. The, the idea behind continuous deployment is that it becomes boring. It becomes something that you don't even think about. I committed my code. I'm going to have my coffee. That's your plan. There is nothing else after committing your code from brain perspective, thinking about it. We get fast user feedback. We have real definition of done. That, that is one of the things that I'm freaking out, right? Especially with agile teams. They all have boards and kind of definition of done, you know? I developed my code and then somehow it's done, or I tested it, it's done. No, it's done when it's running in production. That's the only, only, only way you can say it's really done. Everything else is faking it. I, I did my part, it's done. Kind of, maybe it will work, we know, we'll know. We'll find out. Increased quality, decreased cost, and all those things. And my personal favorite is that once you automate everything that is repetitive, then you can actually do something that brings value. Because it has no, it, it's pointless to anybody to pay anybody's salary just by doing the same thing over and over again. That's what machines do well, really well. So, continuous delivery, you want it, you really claim that you're doing it, most likely you failed, uh, or you're faking that you're doing it, and if you still think that you are, at the end of it, you're really in a very, very small minority of people or company that are truly, truly doing it. And you, could you should really be proud. So, let's go to, to what he said, the guy with the beard. The first one, thou shalt be agile, right? Who is agile here? I bet most of you are going to raise your hand, most of you, right? You're doing stand-ups every day and then you think you're agile, right? Is that, is that how it works, right? I, I bet it is. Because do you have departments? Who of you who is agile has a testing department or development department or this department or that department? Because if you have departments, you cannot be agile. Simply it's contradictory because there is lean time. You do your stuff, you send it to them, and then kind of like I'm waiting for something because I'm agile. I'm waiting for something during the stand-up meeting, right? Kind of somebody else will do something. Uh, most companies are really still organized in departments, in silos that prevents you being agile. And I don't even mean agile like Scrum or Kanban and all those things. I mean in a literal sense of the world. Words, you are fast. You have no lean time. You're not waiting for anybody to do anything. You just move as fast as you can and nothing is stopping you, right? And really very few of us are. And that's the first prerequisite, because if you have handovers, if you're waiting for somebody to do something so that you can do something else, then you cannot be continuous. Simply, that's contradictory to the word, meaning of the word continuous. You're not continuing and waiting for somebody or something to happen. The second one, thou shalt refactor. I would say that whomever of, whomever of you is a developer, if you're not spending at least a third of a time, if not maybe even half, refactoring, if most of your time is spent churning new features, not a new feature, new feature, that's really not how we do business anymore. Because then what, what happens is that after months, after half a year, a year, after some time, you end up with a wonderful work of art, which is your application which is say, this cannot be tested anymore, this cannot be built anymore, this cannot, uh, we need kind of, uh, we have a request to change the color of, of, of text and it takes us three weeks to go through our processes because our application is so messed up, so artful that uh, we, don't, we cannot really deal with it anymore. And the reason why we get works of art in our software is because we are not spending enough time refactoring. And it's very hard to sell, because if you have you know, those traditional managers uh, who are pushing you all the time for new features, it's very hard to explain that you're going to spend half of your time producing nothing. Because for a manager, if you refactor something, you're producing nothing. There is no new feature, there is nothing, right? It's just written differently from management perspective, right? And it's very hard to sell, but it's it's a necessity because if your application is not up to date, if your, up -to -date, uh, your application is not small, fast, fast to build, fast to test, easy to test, and all those things, easy to deploy, 
then you cannot proceed, kind of like just stop here, go home, do something else. Then uh, one of the things I, I hear often, at least you're probably, that's not your case because you're great, but other, some other companies, uh, they have like continuous deployment department or CICD department or something like that, right? Thinking that somehow actually you know what they know what others are doing, they know what developers are developing, they're trying to standardize, they're trying to build those super uber pipelines that really lead nowhere. Existence of, of CICD department should be abomination, it should be declared illegal. It's horrible because developers, and when I say developers, I don't mean literally developers, I mean team that owns a product or a project must be the only entity that actually is in charge of their pipeline because they're developing the code, they're testing the code, they're supposed to know how to move their code to production from the beginning to the end, from that commit all until it's there, right? So if you do have a continuous something or something else department, the only thing that makes sense for you to do is to actually educate people, right? That makes sense, that I agree, but you don't do work for others. You can create services for others, but you cannot do work for others because then others are waiting for you. And then we are going at the very beginning of departments of introducing lean times and all those things. So, no, thou shalt educate everybody. You should not do things for others. You should let the teams be autonomous. Thou shalt be small. Meaning that whomever of you, is any of you working in a team that has more than eight people? You're wonderful here. I love you. Because everybody else, or you, you're just ashamed to admit it. One of those two things. And I bet it's the later. I bet it's the later. Because a team, and when I say a team, I don't mean my team of testers. I don't mean my team of developers. I mean my team capable of managing this product, this application from the beginning to the end. That's what I mean by team. So summarize all of you, and then you get the team, right? And if you say more than eight people, it's simply, that's not a team anymore. That's a, that's a bus, that's a school reunion, that's a football match, but not a team. Simply because more than eight people cannot effectively work together. They need to start coordinating, they need to start opening Jira tickets, they need to start writing, signing documents and doing God knows what. Eight people is a magic number, that's a maximum number of people that can work effectively. That's what... Amazon, for example, calls two pizza team. That's how many people you can feed with two pizzas. More than two pizzas is too expensive. <laughs> Thou shalt, and what all that means is that what prevents you from having small teams are very likely your applications. If your application is huge and can be managed only with 100 people or with 20 people, then you cannot have a small team. That's very simple rules of physics. Big things cannot be managed with small amount of people. Uh, so that's why, that's probably the main reason why we are using monoliths, why we are splitting things in a monolith simply. It's not all those, probably in other talks you hear that we want microservices because uh, of this technical reason or that technical reason. That's all bollocks. The main reason why we want microservices, why we want to split monoliths is that we can, as humans, can work effectively. Right? We can have that small people, two developers, one tester, one person who knows how to deploy, one somebody lost from Oracle still managing database that nobody uses, something like that, right? Eight people in total. And then happens that you will discover later on why in the, all, those, all those things are steps. You cannot go to the next step without passing to the first one. Then you're gonna figure out that you cannot not uh, practice test-driven development. And this is the very easiest one to explain. If you don't write your test before your code and everything is automated, that means that you're going to commit something. It's never going to fail. Your pipeline is always going to work because there is no test that tests it. Test is going to come tomorrow, right? So test needs to be written before the code. Because if you go at the very beginning of my talk, code goes to production. That means that everything that is required for that code to go through the pipeline and reach production needs to be done before that commit. That means, it's, and it's, I think it's a mental challenge in many cases to understand 
that, the, that we switch the order of what, how we do and when we do things. Developer is the last person, human, in chain. Whomever needs to do something else, needs to do it before that developer. So tests are requirements. Tests are defining what that developer is going to develop. And then those same tests are validating that when he commits, what he developed is correct. So test-driven development, if there are no tests, there are no commits. And uh, without commits, there is no business, there is no reason for, any, for you to get your salary. Maybe some. Uh, then, the next one, who, who's using Jenkins, for example, here? Nobody? Only few? Okay, then the rest of you might not understand what I'm going to say. Unless you're using Bamboo, then you're in a really bad place. Uh, those shall define your continuous deployment pipeline as code. Those days when we were using UIs to do things are long gone. Nobody creates web pages anymore by dragging and dropping something onto something else, right? Nobody's using ESBs anymore by dropping and drop, uh, dragging and dropping something to something else. And the same thing applies to everything. Everything we do, UIs are dead for developers. That's for management and CTOs and CEOs and all those things. But in continuous deployment pipeline, it's defined as code. Whatever, whichever tool you use, I don't care, but it needs to be code. Because code, we know as developers that with code, we have some really, really good practices that we know that they work to well together. You can commit, you can see history of what you did, you can merge, you can do pull requests, you can do code revisions, you can do all those things that you must do because you have code. No more, please don't, whichever tools you're using, don't do any more those things like, oh, I need a pipeline, uh, click, 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 click. Uh, become religious, pray to God, it will probably work. So, no more clicking around. Then, let's go further. We are getting, getting close to all 10 of them. Those shall have a fast pipeline. Now, if your pipeline takes more than, okay, let, let me, because it, I'm not gonna use measures in time because that depends from one country to another. So I'm gonna visually explain how fast it has to be. The speed is that I finish my code. I commit. I go and have coffee. Take coffee, walk towards my desk while drinking coffee, maybe stop to speak with somebody for a minute or two, come back to my desk and start working on a new thing. Nothing is supposed to interrupt me when I work on a new feature. That means that whatever was supposed to, be, to happen with my commit happened during that period of time. So your, your pipeline needs to be, the speed of your pipeline needs to be such that it la doesn't last more than the time it takes you to get coffee and continue working. In Romania, that's probably like 15 minutes, right? In Spain, it's hour and a half. <laughs> it really varies greatly from country to country. But the coffee time, that's why I didn't say how many minutes, because really it depends from, it's a cultural issue. Okay? So, one coffee, not longer. And if your application now, some of you might be saying, Oh, it's impossible for my application to be built and tested and this and that. Per just say, performance tests I exclude from this story, right? That's, that's separate. So you might easily say, I, cannot, I don't have an application that, cannot, that can be built, tested, deployed, and all those things in, in 15 minutes. I'm pretty sure at least one of you is thinking that. And if that's what you're thinking, then you need to go way back, way back, and rethink the second commandment. Right? If it takes more than 15 minutes, make it 20. Go to Spain if you need half an hour. <laughs> but if it's more than that, then your application is not designed to be buildable, testable, deployable. And you did not keep up with times because we have tools, we have processes, industry knows how to do it. Uh, it's very hard if you still have, who's working for bank here? Cobol. The best thing you can do with COBOL is never to touch it again. <laughs> Just let it be. So where was I? 
Not here, maybe here. Yes, okay. So next one. Now finally you're doing it fast, you're having nice application, it's really designed well, it's refactored continuously, you're doing TDD, all those things. You're great, right? You really, this is now really advanced. You're, you're, you're becoming candidates to work in Google soon. Now, fixing a failed pipeline. If something fails during those 15 minutes, half an hour, whatever the time is, there is nothing of higher priority than fixing it. Because when you think about it logically, it doesn't make sense not to, if you com commit often, multiple times a day, maybe you as a person once a day, let's say, Whatever you committed and whatever failed, it's still in your brain, you know what the problem is. How hard can it be to fix something that you uh, did an hour ago? Very easy, right? Fixing it day after, it's very hard. Fixing it week after, it's almost Im it's just a m it's, it's madness. And now I know that in some cases your management might say, you know, uh, yeah, but we need new features, we're going back to new features, we cannot dedicate time to fixing problems, we're gonna let it be, let it slide to the next project so that next manager can actually deal with it. But fixing realistically, fixing a problem, that's why we want speed, we want to get the feedback about what we committed before we start working on starting something new. That's why those 15 minutes are important, because I wanna, if there is a problem, I wanna fix it before I move on. So that's really, you fix, fix it first and then move somewhere else later. Now, for those of you, any of you using Sonar? Nobody. Somebody must be using Sonar, right? And you have those statistics, I bet you have those statistics and bet that somebody in your organization make, made the rule, if more than 20% of fail, tests fail, we need to do something. It's okay to have shit, <laughs> but in a very limited quantity. <laughs> kind of, you know. If it doesn't get to my ankles, it's okay, kind of like, I, I can have boots, no, kind of. Or, or those static analysis uh, rules, kind of like, every, uh, we will not let any build pass further unless every function has a comment. And then you're clever, I know you, right? You go and then put dot in every <laughs> slash slash dot. And all those rules, right? That's ridiculous. I mean, many of the, some of those rules make sense, some of those doesn't, but what it doesn't make sense is to, is to follow them blindly, and what doesn't make more sense is not to fix it. If you think something is a problem, you fix it immediately. If you don't fix it immediately, then just let it rot, then put it next to that cobble thing and <laughs> let it live. So, getting closer, thou shalt run the CD pipeline locally. There is no excuse for a developer to be unfriendly, menacing to his colleagues. Meaning that, you know, I'm gonna, I, I see that a lot, kind of like, I, I write code, you know, like, the, I write code with legs and arms and all those things, I commit, and let's see whether it builds, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, you know, Jenkins is gonna tell me. And in the meantime, somebody's gonna fork that code and they're gonna work on, on a code that doesn't work because of you, right? So there is no reason for most of the pipeline not to run locally first. You are supposed, those of you who are developer, you are supposed to build it first. You are supposed to test it first, or partly test it first, as much as you can. Spend five minutes of those 15 minutes, or spend 10 minutes of those 15 minutes locally. Most likely it works, then you commit and let what, whichever tool you're using to execute the pipeline and do everything over again, plus additional things, right? You don't commit, you don't expect some external tools to check whether uh, it even com whether it compiles. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. We'll see. So really, uh, otherwise, your coworkers are going to use your code that doesn't work, and that's really just really, really bad. And the last one, and I think that people freak out completely on this one. If everything else that I said before is true, if you have your pipeline that is fully automated, if you have your pipeline that you trust, and I hope you trust it because if it's going to production and you don't trust it, then you're in deep, deep trouble. So you have your pipeline that is fast and you trust it, and I hope that you're committing directly to master. There is no point having branches, or at least there is no point having long-lived branches. Because if you create a branch and say, I'm gonna work on this branch for three weeks, 
and then I'm going to merge it. Then it's, it's not necessarily bad, it's okay, but you cannot use the word continuous. There is nothing continuous in waiting for three weeks or two weeks or even a week until you merge to master because you can at best call it delayed integration or delayed deployment or I don't know what I'm doing, it's going to happen soon and maybe it will work, deployment. So, we either have very short-lived branches, a day, at the end of the day, an hour before you're going to leave your office, merge it. Let the pipeline validate that it works and let it put to production or if you're using delivery instead of deployment, let it um, uh, wait for somebody to press that button. But your code is ready for production at the end of the day. So, who of you is still having your hands up? Nobody? <laughs> Weird nation. Weird nation. <laughs> really. Uh, so, him, not me. If you have Q&A, there's a church nearby. <laughs> Later. Commanded. Thou shall be agile. For real. That's a thing missing from this commandment. Thou shalt refactor continuously all the time. Thou shalt educate everybody how to do, in this case I'm talking about continuous deployment, but it applies to any other, anything else. Everybody needs to have at least a high level knowledge of everything. If you don't know how, if you're a coder and you don't know how it's going to be tested, you don't know how to design your code to be testable. If you don't know how it's going to be deployed, you don't know how to design your code. And so on and so forth. You should be very small. You should have small teams, up to eight people. And when I say small team, I mean small self-sufficient team. I don't mean small team of eight testers and then 75 developers. I mean, really, everybody together in the same room. You should practice test-driven development, any flavor. I don't care whether you're, you're, you're doing TDD or you're doing BDD or DD, whatever DDs or TDs and BDs and whatever letters you want to put together as long as your tests are driving development. Uh, your pipeline should always be this defined as code. No more clicking around if any of you is doing that. Uh, your pipeline should be fast, very fast. Uh, fixing a failed pipeline is always higher priority than anything else. Whatever you're doing, stop doing it. Fix your problem first. Uh, you should run most of the steps locally. Uh, and you will commit to master branch. If you don't listen to the hymn, there is a shopping mall nearby. <laughs> so, that's, uh, that's me. I think I was a bit faster than 45. I don't know how much time I have even. So, as I said, Spain, Romania, time is relative, it changes. This is my blog. Uh, stuff, 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 stuff. Buy my books. Uh, you, can, you can ask me questions and I will consult with... No. Yeah, so definitely earlier. We have 15 minutes left. So I'm faster great. than any of you. So, please go ahead if anyone has any question. Adam. Uh, no, not Adam. Come on, it's a challenge. <laughs> How do you run the local pipeline with Jenkins? Do you run a local Jenkins? No, I don't run it with Jenkins. <laughs> okay. I don't run it with Jenkins. I mean, uh, Jenkins, is, Jenkins is a place, in my case, where you put things that you do locally. So, whichever commands you use to build, that's your first step in Jenkins, right? Whichever commands you use as a developer to unit test, copy-paste. Copy, paste, copy, paste. Jenkins is a reflection of what you do locally. It's not what you do locally is a reflection of Jenkins does. Plus few additional things like performance testing. You're not going to do performance locally. Even though kind of 16 gigas now is on, on laptops is more than many servers I've seen in companies, but that's, that's a separate issue. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Adam. Someone else? Hi, Victor, and thank you for the awesome presentation. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, let's say, scenario. We have a product. It's in a deep pile of shit. Okay. 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 And uh, This is not recorded, no? We can say those things. Yeah, we can. 
<laughs> we'll edit it. That's okay. Okay, so it stinks. And uh, now we're faced with the situation to either, either write some tests and uh, establish a pipeline or uh, refactor so we can write tests and so on. Uh, what's your advice? What should we do first? I don't know. First option, can you change the company? <laughs> if that's not an option, yeah. then we can explore alternatives. <laughs> I could. But I you like don't you like it? Yeah, okay. I like okay. it, and I like to. You're a masochist. Done. You like suffering. That's <laughs> that's good. He likes he likes guys like 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 that. He likes people who like suffering. That's okay. Okay. So, uh, I mean, that's one of the things I think I like about microservices. You can say, okay, I have this pile of something, right? And I'm gonna try not to touch it much. But then, when comes the next opportunity, to and I assume that this is so old that refactoring is most likely going to fail anyway. <laughs> so I agree. you probably want to take next feature you're developing and separate. Say, OK, this is, this is going to be my new service, new microservice. It's going to communicate with this thing and start kind of like, you know, churning like a big rock and start churning parts of it and moving it away and then making it better. I, I prefer that way because. I would guess if it would be easy to refactor, you would have done it already, <laughs> most likely, right? I agree, I agree. Uh, thank you. That's a really good advice. Hi. Uh, Hi. You, you mentioned uh, about uh, continuous delivery pipeline as code. Yes. Can you emphasize the idea, maybe give us some suggestions? Or Depends on the tool. Which tool are you using? Maybe. <laughs> no. uh, I mean, cloud formation. Is, cloud is formation. You, you don't do, you don't do continuous deployment with cloud formation, as far as I know. Maybe somebody was very creative, but I mean, continuous deploy. You do deployment, but when I say continuous deployment, I mean you build your code, you build your containers, most likely, hopefully, uh, you run your unit tests. You don't do these things with cloud formation. I, as uh, maybe I'm mistaken. Any idea okay. is welcome. Uh, okay, if you want ideas, then uh, I, might push I must push my cloud base head. Yeah, use Jenkins. Uh, create a Jenkins file. Uh, put it in a repository where your code is. Uh, use multi-branch pipelines so that uh, jobs are created automatically for every branch in your, in your code, even though I said don't use branches. Uh, once you start moving to the second project, then you will start discovering that there are repetitive things in Jenkins files between the two projects. Then you're going to create a third repository that's going to have shared libraries and where you're going to start putting things that are common in multiple pipelines uh, so that they're reused and we don't repeat it ourselves. I think that this was the fastest answer I could give. <laughs> but I can go in more details if you well. want. <laughs> Does that answer you? Okay. Hello, do you have a Spanish version for the, of that? Huh? Do you have a Spanish version of that answer? Of that answer? <laughs> Maybe. It would take an hour and a half, probably. Hour right? and a half, yes. And I would need, uh, I would need to have some cava, I mean, uh, some wine and uh, paella, probably. And I would need to s at least see, see, in, in, if not touching it. So if you don't, if you cannot meet those requirements. But the uh, short version is that, yes, if you want, in case you're using Jenkins, Jenkins file uh, allows you to define pipeline as code using Jenkins DSL, which is based on Groovy. Don't get scared. It's not really hard. I haven't used in city in, in like 10 years, so I, I, I don't want to. Can you define it as code? Yeah. Then if you cannot define it as code, then uh, the best thing you can do with Team City is to stop using it. No, no I'm, I'm not marketing now Jenkins. Go to Travis, go to CircleCI, go to Coldship. Uh, YAML is okay. You don't have to do Groovy. Uh, just define it as a file, put it in repository. The gen brains, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You haven't used it, really. Anybody else? Okay, if not, nobody else, I'm going to ask you a question. Oh. That's okay. I don't so want to sleep with you. <laughs> so you've been to many companies and tried to, to make this dream a reality, like continuous deployment, right? Yes. Uh, from your experience, what, what's the most important uh, thing that's actually stopping a lot of these culture. companies? Of culture. Culture, no doubt. No, technology is never a problem. 
Only He's never. Everybody thinks that their technology is a problem. Every kind of oh, only if yeah, it failed adopting X. It, it failed adopting this. We failed uh, adopting uh, virtual machines. We failed this. But this time, if we do Kubernetes, it's going to be different. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, you're going to suffer equally, but in a different way. Uh, I mean, uh, so I, I think that. Every, whatever you do is always reflection of communication paths in your company. If you have 57 departments, you're going to have 57 solutions. If you have uh, 13 departments, that means that you will have 29 stops be between something happens. Departments are killing things. Uh, what you want to do is to help self-sufficient teams. And that's a cultural change. Because what will happen with self-sufficient teams is so every department is like a company within a company, right? And every department has a manager. And his power is measured with the number of people. Now, if he manages to do it faster with less people, then he loses power. Like kind of, I'm a big shot manager, I have 100 people under me, right? And nobody's gonna, uh, people are very reluctant to, to say, okay, I'm gonna give you two people for that self-sufficient teams, and two for, I'm gonna start losing people from my grip, right? Uh, managers don't like that. And that's, that's one of the obstacles. And in general, uh, all those things and uh, the ways how big guys are working, Google, Netflix, this and that, it's always, always based on people building, being autonomous, teams being autonomous. Uh, there is no real mystery. It's just that, uh, if company is pyramidal, structured, silos, it's simply impossible to do it. Among those I visited, worked with? Or no. Okay, I, I can speak uh, and it's only from experience. Those that I visited, I worked with big guys. I, can, I cannot name names, but big guys. Enterprise, you know, those that existed for 175 years. Percentage, like 2%. They all fail. Uh, maybe 10%. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to change. I mean, exaggerating a bit. It's, it's not that low, but uh, it's very hard. You cannot change overnight. Kind of, if you're talking about a company, traditional company, it was not that is that is a software company, but doesn't realize that it's a software company and has like thousand or ten thousand developers uh, using rules somebody made uh, while Henry Ford was still alive. Uh, it's very hard to change. Uh, not for uh, chasing the dream, yes, but not for a long time, because if you check, for example, Fortune 500 companies from 15 years ago and compare it with Fortune 500 the, the companies today, most of them don't exist. So yes, you can change your dream, but soon you will stop chasing because you will be dead. <laughs> uh, I mean, companies are this, it doesn't look like that, uh, but companies are disappearing overnight. Traditional companies are going away, industry by industry. Depends, every year different industries attack. Like for example, let's say television company. What is a television company today? What does it mean even? They don't know yet maybe that they are gone. There is no business anymore for television. Uh, soon that will happen with banks. With the difference is that banks have an animal, they print money so they can actually <laughs> do whatever they want. But industries are changing drastically and companies are cha that are chasing the dream. They think that it's... A, and, and I think that's, that's... The word chasing a dream is very misleading because all those things are very doable. The problem is that nobody within... Uh, people with enough authority do not really want to make the decision. Yeah, I know CTO comes and say, we're going to become agile. Right? But they don't really make a decision. They don't really, or DevOps or whatever, they don't really go behind, but just because it's in this year. And you know, it needs to be, this transformation is going to last for a year. And then next year, we're going to do big data and stuff like that. But when they really decide it, and I have examples of, I, again, I cannot name companies, but big companies that did it. It's, it's not a big deal. It can be done. You need to decide. And they don't usually. Uh, 
Pipeline performance or your application performance? No, no, pipeline and key performance. Yeah, lean time. I mean, uh, how fast it goes to production. How often do you <laughs> deliver something to production? I, I'm not very fond of, in general, about human-related metrics because I think that they're very misleading. I'm trying to avoid that whenever possible because very often uh, the, the, on, the only... I'm going to answer it with a type of metric, not necessarily which exactly. The only metric that matters is that how well something is going on with the product itself. I really don't care about metrics, how well development part is going, how well testing part is going, how well this or that. There is a feature on a paper, there is a feature running in production. That's the only measurement. And sorry, third one, and did not, did not blow up half an, half an hour later. Three metrics. Uh, anything else? Because I remember like long, long time. In a previous life, we had that, that metric that I, w I was a tech lead of, of a devel development team. And development team had uh, a met uh, objective not to have more than I don't know how many tickets opened by QA. And what was the result of that? They simply delivered everything much later. Because kind of like it's not about anything else. I just need to make sure and sure and sure that it never fails. Uh, metrics are very misleading, I think. People's happiness, that's a good one. We still have some time. Three, four minutes. Oh. You mentioned Bamboo earlier. And you don't seem Bamboo? To yeah, yes. you don't seem to be a fan. Uh, no. Why, why is it a fitting for uh, continuous delivery? And because uh, I think that Bamboo is ugly clone child of Jenkins, uh, my personal opinion. Now, I'm not trying to sell you Jenkins. I think that there are new tools with new philosophies that are worthwhile exploring. Uh, CodeShip, uh, Travis, CircleCI, they're good alternatives. They're real alternatives to Jenkins. Bamboo is just something that tried to do the same thing later with the same architecture and never actually had enough uh, community behind it. So but first of all, I would never ever personally adopt any product that is not open source. I want to know that there is a follower, a number of followers behind it. Now, I'm not against paying for a product. I'm not against that. But I would only pay for something that is based on open source. That I know that there is a community, that I can see how, much, how, how active they are, what they're doing and all those things. And then I pay for additional enterprise feature, features, I have no problem with that. Bamboo is closed source. It's a clone of Jenkins, a bad one. It brings nothing new to the market. So if, if you have a product like Jenkins that is established already for 15 years, basically, one of the first ones, if not the first one in an area, and you want to compete against it, that's great. But compete with new ideas, not compete, I'm going to do the same thing. That's what Bamboo is doing, my, my personal opinion. And I'm, as I said, I'm not trying to sell you Jenkins. Go to CircleCI, that's really great. Uh, CodeShip is great, uh, Travis is great. They are bringing new stuff to the market. And Bamboo is mostly click, click, click. It was five years ago, I don't know today. And I, I already established click, click, click hurts. It kind of like produces that sound in my head that makes me very no nauseated. They do try to actually update that in the latest version and uh, actually have some specs, but yeah. Good for them. <laughs> Copy paste, like you said. Copy paste. Okay, guys, I think that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, see you after lunch. <laughs>